Right before we jump into this video, if you haven't signed up for the Fronos Photo email list, just look for this orange box over on the website, put your name, email address in it, hit send it, and I will send you a free guide to capturing motion in low light situations. Jared Poland, Fronos Photo. Dot com and this is truly the ultimate battle and versus video between the Nikon Z6, Sony a7 III, and Canon EOS R. Now this is going to be one of the most important videos to help you decide which one of these cameras might be right for you. Now with saying that, I've done real world reviews of each and every one of these cameras, so I have real world experience working with these cameras. You can also download sample RAW files. Everything is linked down below for your viewing pleasure. So now, let's jump into the specs, starting with the image sensors. The Z6 has a 24.5 megapixel full frame BSI CMOS sensor. The a7 III has a 24.2 megapixel full frame BSI CMOS sensor. And the EOS R has a 30.3 megapixel full frame CMOS sensor. It has the same sensor as the 5D Mark IV, which is more expensive. Now keep in mind that the Sony is the oldest camera up here. These two on the sides are newer. Now does newer mean better? It's tough to say because the Sony a7 III is a fan fantastic image sensor. I've gotten some great images off of it. I've also got great images off the Z6, and I guess I've gotten great images with the EOS R as well. This is more of a toss up for the check mark between the Z6 and the a7 III. I think you're gonna see that a lot throughout this video where we're gonna be flipping a coin between these two. I don't think either of these get a check mark, so in this case, we're giving a negative check mark to the EOS R to start it off. Moving on to ISO, where the Z6 will go native from 100 to 51,200, expandable all the way up to 204,800, AKA Swiss cheese mode. The Sony a7 III will do 100 to 51,200, expandable up to the same Swiss cheese mode and the Canon will do 100 to 40,000, expandable up to 102,400, which is not Swiss cheese, it's more like American cheese because it has half the amount of holes. Now I've pushed all of these cameras pretty far in my tests and I feel that the Nikon and the Sony are almost on par. Now I've been shooting Nikon for a long time so I've gone through a lot of Nikon cameras and I've always felt at higher ISOs that the Nikons have performed better than the Canons. Now the Sonys haven't been around as long but in my experience between using these two I'm gonna give a slight edge based off of personal preference, and that's coming from somebody who's been shooting Nikon for a long time, that I think the files are cleaner at higher ISOs on the Nikon side. So I'm going to just give a semi check mark, like a half a chubby, to the Z6. Continuing on, we now will talk about frame rates. How many frames a second you can get with these cameras? With the Z6, you're getting 12 frames a second in 12-bit RAW, nine frames in 14-bit RAW in the high extended mode, or five and a half frames in the normal high mode. Now, I personally shot this camera in the normal high mode with five and a half frames a second because when you shoot in high extended, as you take a picture, you don't get blackout. Now, the reason you don't get blackout is because it's showing you a snippet of the image that you shot before. So it's not a clean shooting experience because you're seeing that image. So it may be harder to track subjects. I didn't have much trouble doing it at the five and a half frames a second because I still had the normal blackout. With the a7 III, you get 10 frames a second with both the electronic and mechanical shutter. All of these cameras up here have electronic and mechanical shutters, and we'll talk more about that in the future. But you get 10 frames a second in both electronic and mechanical with this at the highest bit rate. So you're not dumbing it down by shooting the 10 frames a second. Now when we move on to the EOS R, you're doing eight frames a second in one shot, which is kind of weird, five frames per second in speed priority, and three frames per second in tracking priority. Now I shot this in the five frames a second and didn't have any problem with it. It's also doing a similar thing to the Z6 where you're not getting blackout because it's showing you a preview of the image you just took, but it's super fast and honestly, it wasn't much of an issue when I was shooting. But this is one of the slower shooting cameras compared to these two natively. In this case, for the 10 frames a second, not dumbing it down at all, we're giving a check mark 
to the a7 III. Now it's time to mount something. In this case, the lenses that you can mount to these mounts. The Z6 has a Z mount with the ability to get an F to Z adapter to allow you to shoot with your F mount Nikon lenses. The Sony has an E mount. Now with the E mount, you have native Sony lenses that you can put on to this camera, but you also now have lenses from third party companies like Sigma and Tamron that can mount to this camera. Now on the Nikon side with the Z6, having the F to Z adapter allows you to take your older F mount lenses and adapt them native to your Z6. That is a great function. I still think Sony doesn't have enough glass to compete with Nikon and Canon. Now I shouldn't say compete because they compete very well, but I like having all of the options that I currently have on the pro side to adapt to the Z6 and the Z7. Now that's not saying that the E-mount is bad, though it is smaller than the EOS R as well as the Z6. And there's some debate out there whether or not they can put fast glass on the front of this camera or whether or not they need to. But with the Nikon, you can put super fast glass on there. And when we get to the EOS R, you can also put super fast glass on there as well. So with that being said, the EOS R uses a new RF mount, which allows you to take RF lenses, which are these so far really good lenses super expensive, but super sharp and super nice that go natively onto this camera. Now there are three EF adapters, lens adapters that allow you to attach your EF lenses right on to this mount. And I feel that the adapter works the best and the autofocus works the best with adapted lenses on this particular camera compared to the Nikon. The native Sony lenses, they work really well, but of course the native lenses on all of these work really well. Now, the reason that the EOS R is gonna get the check mark over the other two here is because of those three adapters. Well, honestly, it's really two because three, two, two of them are pretty similar, just one has a multi-function ring and the other doesn't, but one of them gives you the ability to drop in filters behind the lens. So you only need one filter and it's gonna work on all of your lenses. Now for that reason, check mark EOS R. Autofocus will be one of the determining factors to help you decide which one of these cameras are for you. Now let's take a look at the Z6, which has 273 focusing points that are phase detect with no IAF. The Sony a7 III has 693 focusing points that are phase detect AF, and it has edge to edge 93% coverage, but it has IAF and touch to drag AF on the back of the screen, which the Nikon does not have. Now the Canon EOS R says it has 5,655 phase detect AF points, which is a lot of autofocusing points, except for the fact that it's not like you can independently select those because you can't count. Like I literally went through and tried to count them all and I didn't see that many that were active that I could get but that's a lot of focusing points. It covers a ton of the viewfinder. All of these pretty much go edge to edge. The Sony stretches a little further than the other two, but the Canon also gives you touch and drag AF, and so far a crappy IAF that's not as good as the IAF in the Sony. Now because of that, because the Sony has the best AF of all of these cameras up here, I'm gonna deduct a point which is a check mark from both of these cameras on the outside. Now it's time to move on to the Michael buffer. He wants to rumble, but I can't say it, or they, they used to sue people for that, but let's talk about the buffers on these cameras. The Z6, 43 raw files in high extended, but in normal high mode, you basically won't fill the buffer. The a7 III will give you 40 raw files in a row, where the EOS R will give you 47 raw files in a row. I could not outrun the EOS R for whatever reason. But I don't think there's much of a difference here to determine that one is better than the other because they are all very good and you really shouldn't outrun the buffer in either of these. So we're gonna just do a whoosh 
a wash across the board with no check marks. Let me cut in here real quick and let you know that this video is brought to you by Squarespace. Squarespace is what I personally use for jaredpolen.com and my online photo portfolio. If you'd like to get a free trial, head on over to squarespace.com slash photo to get a 14 day free trial. And if you decide that it's for you, use the code photo at checkout to get 10% off your first order. Now let's get back to the comparison. Today, one of the most important things that you will want to find in your cameras are video capabilities. So which one of the three of these have the best video capabilities? Let's start with the Z6, which does full frame 4K without pixel binning, which is oversampled from 6K. It also does 10-bit 422 with end log to an external recorder with a slight crop. It does full frame 120 frames per second at 10 80p. Now the Sony a7 III does full frame 4K UHD video recording up to 30 frames a second, 4K oversampled from 6K with no pixel binning. It also does full frame 120 frames a second at 1080p, and it will do 4K S-Log to an external recorder, but it won't do it in 10-bit. Now the EOS R comes in with a 1.74X crop mode to do 4K video recording up to 30 frames a second. It only does 720p at 120 frames a second without autofocus. It does do C-Log with clean 10-bit 422 out to an external recorder. That 1.74X crop mode is a killer in this camera, especially when its competitors are doing full frame with no pixel binning, 4K downsampled from 6K. These two cameras kick ass with their video recording capabilities. They do a great job. The Canon does an okay job. These two do a great job. Does the Nikon get the slight edge because it can do 422 10-bit externally, Steven? Yes. Steven says yes which means, oh God, this is tough because these are very similar. Just because of that one thing, we'll give a check mark to the Nikon. Continuing on with important video features, we're now up to autofocus where the Nikon used to suck because it didn't do it. it it, it didn't do it, but it does it now. The Nikon has full-time autofocus with a mode called AFF with subject tracking. The Sony does face detection and it tracks the subjects extremely well. And then the Canon has dual pixel AF with face detection as well. This is a tough one because they're all very good now. For the first time ever, we can actually say that the Nikon, Nikon, you don't suck for the first time they don't suck with autofocus video. Sony's very good with autofocus and the dual pixel AF is still fantastic. But across the board here, they are so very similar at this point that they all do a very good job. So everybody, who gets to check mark? Everybody. Moving on to image stabilization built into the camera. The Nikon Z6 has five axis in-body VR for both stills and video. The Sony has five axis steady shot for stills and video. And the Canon, well, it sucks with digital five way, which crops in a ton. Basically, Canon screwed up. They didn't put in body stabilization. They say that in body stabilization isn't really needed because their lenses have great stabilization. I call bullshit on that. They're gonna put it in one day when they decide to finally do it. Then they'll be like, our lenses are great, but in body stabilization is even better. That's what they're gonna say. So it really comes down to these two cameras right here. For stills, they're gonna both be very similar. I've handheld both the Nikon Z6 and the Z7 down to one tenth of a second, zoomed out to 200 millimeters, and the picture is tack sharp. It's not just because I'm great at autofocus, it's because this camera allows me to do that with the built-in five axis stabilization. The Sony does that for stills, and it does it for video as well. There's a subtle difference here. In Steven's tests, when he was using these cameras in the real world. When I say these, I mean the Z6 and the Z7. He noticed a slight micro jitter. We're calling it a micro jitter when he was doing running and gunning because when you look in close, you can see that it's a little bit wobbly. It's subtle, 
but it's there, whereas the Sony with the steady shot, it doesn't have it. It's a little cleaner and a little better, so check mark is going to the a7 III. Now this section isn't as important, but I brought it up for one reason. Now all of these cameras are Wi-Fi and NFC capable. The Canon also is Bluetooth, but it is one of the first cameras that gives you the ability to, when you're shooting JPEGs, to live transfer that to a phone or another device. Now, that doesn't make up for the fact that it has one card slot, but it does allow you to shoot those full res JPEGs and have them transfer to your phone, which is gonna kill the battery of the phone. It's, I don't think that it is a great option, but it's a nice option to have. Nobody's getting a check mark because I don't care that much about this section. Moving on to the electronic viewfinders that you find in these cameras. The Z6 has a 3.69 million dot electronic viewfinder. The Sony has a 2.4 million dot electronic viewfinder and the Canon has a 3.6 million dot electronic viewfinder as well. You'll find newer viewfinders in these two cameras on the outside. The Nikon one is tremendous. I love the electronic viewfinder. I really enjoyed using the electronic viewfinder of the EOS R as well. And as an added bonus, both the Nikon and the Canon stick out from the back of the LCD screen so your nose isn't getting smushed in there as much as it is with the A7 III. Now the A7 III's electronic viewfinder is older. It's not as clear, it's not as colorful, it's not as vibrant. It's still good, but it's older. This is more of a toss up between the Canon and the Nikon because I think they both do a great job. It's hard to say which one should get the check mark in this case because they both are very good. So in that case, half a check mark to the Nikon and a half a check mark to the Canon. Vary angle touch screens, tilting touch screens, no touch screens. What kind of screens do we have? The Z6 has a 3.2 inch, 2.1 million dot tilting touch screen. The A7 III has a three inch, really crappy 922,000 dot tilting touch LCD screen with limited touch capability and functionality, where I didn't mention that the Z6 allows you to basically scroll through your menu settings and touch it. But what the Sony does have, even though it's limited, it does allow you to touch and drag your focusing points, which is really good uh, for moving your focusing points. The EOS R has a 3.15 inch, 2.1 million dot vary angle touch screen. Now vary angle means it comes out, it flips around, it rotates, you can get it at different angles. It's nice when you can hit things at different angles, it really brings more pleasure to the, the, to the job of shooting photos. In this case, having this vary angle touch screen, oh, it also gives you the ability to touch and drag focus, which I love. So because Nikon doesn't do that, I would throw it off the counter here. In this case, the check mark's going to the Canon because you have the ability to flip it out, rotate it, it's just more options. It goes more ways. Let's talk about how these cameras feel in your hands. I was surprised to find that the EOS R feels fantastic in my hands. Canon did a great job of not trying to make this the smallest mirrorless camera in the world. They made it feel like a DSLR that's slightly smaller, but it still feels great because it has an extra deep grip for holding onto the camera. It also has the ability to add a vertical grip with full functionality and add extra batteries. That's nice. What it doesn't have is a joystick, but I found in my shooting that it's much easier to just touch and drag with the LCD screen because there's so many focusing points that it would take longer to move with a joystick. They did add something new on the back of this camera, which is a multi-function bar, which I've basically turned off, but it may come in handy if you're using it for video to change some features like you could change your ISO quicker, you could change your white balance. It's something that they need to improve into the future. I really don't like it that much, but it is a function and a feature that they added to this camera. The Sony is the worst feeling camera of the three of them right here. The rubber feels very slippery. It really does feel slick in your hands. It's light, it's compact, but it really doesn't feel great in the hands. It doesn't have as deep of a grip. The viewfinder doesn't stick out far enough but you can add a vertical grip with a battery pack with all the functionalities that you need, which is nice to have. And the Nikon has a really deep grip. I think it's designed very well. It feels great in the hands. It has that joystick, but like I said, I rather have touch and drag, which the Nikon doesn't have on the back of this camera. It feels really good, but if you wanna get a vertical grip with functionality, 
uh-uh, you're not getting it. No, you're not, because Nikon's stupid. I mean, they're not really stupid, they're stupid. All right, somebody was stupid at Nikon who said, let's not make a vertical grip with functionality. Let's just make a battery pack that isn't even out yet or announced. So you suck. You only suck for that case. Now, in this case, I'm, I'm gonna go with EOS R for body feel. I just really think it feels great. Memory card slots. I'm thinking the camera with the most slots is probably gonna win this one. Let's start with the Z6. It has one card slot. I've really talked about that a lot. I'm not happy with it, but the card that it uses is an XQD card, which is super fast, super reliable. It's a fantastic card. Now the Sony offers you two card slots. They're both SD. One of them is UHS-1, the other is UHS-2. So the writing speeds, it's kind of split up there. I don't know why they didn't do two UHS-2 slots, but what it does give you the ability to do that these other cameras obviously can't do is shoot redundant. You get photos going to both cards, raw files backed up, but better yet, you could do video redundant, shooting video and saving it to both cards at the same time, just in case there's ever an issue. I want redundancy. I want it now. I just came up with that slow. It's like I need a sign that, that says I want redundancy and I want... Anyway, the Canon has one UHS-2 SD card slot. So the winner here clearly, more slots are better. Sony's getting a check. You know what, Sony? You get two check marks for two card slots. I wanted to cut in here real quick and let you know that we just released 14 custom Lightroom presets. Check out the different looks you can get quickly by using presets like Black and White Boomify, Aquamarine, Sandlot, Color Boomify, Skittles, and more. Head on over to frontosphoto.com slash presets to play with and purchase all 14 of these presets at 40% off for a limited time. Now let's jump back to the video. That brings us up to the second most important test of them all, the wind tunnel test. And I'm doing this different. I'm gonna block your view. That's right, I'm gonna go right here and I'm gonna... That's right. Wind tunnel test time. You know, I you know I think I think Canon won this one. Now let me explain to you why. Nikon's a little flat on the front, so it catches the extra air. The Sony, worst edges ever on a camera. There's no like, it doesn't spill over. And the Canon, just look at that nice little, it just it's just better. It's just better. So Canon wins the wind tunnel test. And the most important test, which you should all pay close attention to, is the sniff test. Sony. Sony wins the sniff test because I could smell some IAF up in there. Battery life is extremely important when you're shooting with mirrorless cameras, so let's see what the Z6 offers you. One ENEL 15B battery with USB charging, but only when the camera is off. The Sony a7 III gives you the NPZ battery. The Z battery is rated for 710 shots and you can charge the camera via USB-C while you're shooting. That Z battery was designed by Sony specifically for the mirrorless cameras. The Z6 I didn't mention, I squeezed out over 700 photos and still had 5% left, but I think that the Sony Z batteries are slightly better than what you're gonna get out of the Nikon. The Z battery's good and you can charge it while you're shooting, which is super cool. The EOS R uses the LPE6N battery. It can do USB charging also, except you need to use their proprietary charger. That's what they recommend. And in our testing, that is what has worked. I probably got five-ish, 600 shots out of it. So you're getting similar amount of shots out of it. But I think in this case, because you can charge the camera even while shooting, Sony's getting the check mark. If weight is important to you, then pay attention. Because I'm talking about the weight of the cameras. The Z6 weighs in at 1.29 pounds or 585 grams. The Sony weighs in at 1.43 pounds or 650 grams. And the Canon comes in at the heaviest at 1.45 pounds or 660 grams. All of these cameras are light. If you're looking for the lightest camera, then the check mark goes to the Nikon. If you're looking for the heaviest camera, in this case, it's going to the Canon. And if you're looking for the one that's right in the middle, well then of course you're going with the Sony. But really, across the board, these cameras don't weigh that much. And finally, 
price. The Z6 comes in at $2,146.95 with the adapter. It's important to tell you that because you really do need the adapter, especially if you want to take your F mount lenses and bring them over. The Sony comes in at $1,998 and the Canon is the most expensive with the least amount of features at $2,398 with the adapter. They're all very similar. This is the point where I'm gonna tell you which one I think you should get. If you're already a Nikon shooter and you have a lot of Nikon F mount glass, you should stick with the Nikon. The Z6 is a fantastic camera. It's a great first generation mirrorless camera that Nikon has put out. I've done some great shooting with this. We've used it with photos. We've used it with stills. It's great. The Sony is a fantastic, well-rounded camera. It might have been one of the best cameras ever released at the time it was released because nobody else offered what this camera offered. The mirrorless capabilities, the silent shootings, the form factor. Sony did a great job and this is priced Right. If you're new to the game, would you go with this Sony? I think a lot of people who are new to the game are being pulled into Sony because Sony's marketing has done a tremendous job getting the young people interested. There's a lot of lenses you can get for it. There's a lot of third party lenses for it. I still personally lean towards the Nikon because I have a lot of Nikon glass. So I would go with the Nikon. But if the Nikon didn't exist or you're starting out fresh, you're going to flip a coin and decide which one is for you between these two cameras because it's not easy to determine which one is right for you. Now moving on to the Canon, if you're a Canon shooter and you still haven't switched most likely to Sony, the EOS R is a nice, nice start. The EF adapter is great. Your EF lenses autofocus tremendously well on this camera. Some people, and I'll say most people, were upset with the specs in this camera. But when you start shooting it, you realize that it is actually a pretty good camera to shoot with. You get your video with that big crop, you get your nice stills, you don't have in-body stabilization, but you have the new autofocus, you have the ability to use all your older lenses. If you're a Canon shooter and you're gonna stick to being a Canon shooter because you already have a lot of glass, you can go with this or wait for the higher megapixel version that they're most likely coming out with in the next few months. But if you had to decide between these three cameras up here to start off today, it's probably not the Canon. It's really a toss up between the Nikon and the Sony. As you know, I'm slightly biased being a Nikon shooter that owns 17 different professional lenses. I'm leaning, well, you can tell that I'm fully leaning towards the Nikon. It's a tough choice. I like the feel of the Nikon, but the image qualities are very similar and you get IAF in this camera. I'm not even gonna gander a guess on which one you should go with. Hopefully this video has helped you decide which way you think you should go. And if you'd like to pick up these cameras or any other cameras for that matter, or any camera gear, head on over to adorama.com fro, because when you use that link, it helps us to continue to make free content like we're doing right here. So what do you think? Which one would you go with? Leave some comments down below with which one and why. And don't forget to like, share, comment, and subscribe, and hit that bell button so you can be notified when new videos go live. So thank you guys very much for watching. Jared Poland, froknowsphoto.com. See ya. Have you downloaded my gear vault yet? If not, it's the best way to input, organize, and protect your gear and get an insurance quote. If you haven't downloaded it yet, head on over to mygearvault.com because it's free for iOS and Android.